Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, exactly how I wrote it. <laughs> so my name is Owen Xia, and I work for a local digital marketing agency, not a design house. So I don't really consider myself as a designer, not anymore. I used to consider myself as a UX designer or web designer, but I stopped calling me, myself that mainly because of three reasons. The first and the most important reason is that I cut my long hair. I'm not saying that all designers should have long hair, but I certainly felt a lot more credible when I looked like that. And the second reason is that um, nowadays my job scope entails a lot of uh, web analytics, a lot of digital marketing uh, in advertising, a lot of uh, search engine optimization. Right? Whenever I go for client meetings, if I feel that the client is kind of difficult to handle, I just start throwing out uh, all those acronyms, DMP, SSP, DSP, you know, which stands for Accelerated Multiple Pages, Supply Side Management, uh, Supply Side Platform, and Data Management Platform, and all that. But when I was a designer, right, I find it relatively difficult to handle clients. I usually run into very tough clients. And uh, I think all of them can be divided into two groups. Here are the two groups. The first is those I call micromanagers. They will tell you something like, um, you know, feel free to be creative. And uh, after you submit the, your design, they say, oh, and I love your design, but can we just make a few minor changes? And they won't take much time of yours at all. And then you get something like that. Uh, and the second group is kind of the opposite of the first group, because the first group kind of know what they wanted, and the second group really has very little idea what they want. At the start of the project, they will tell you, well, I'm not sure what I want, but I'll know it when I see it. And when you submit your design, they will say, uh, you know what, I love your design, but can we make it pop? I never figured out what that meant, because right? it's really difficult to make a page pop. So based on my experience, the more client is involved in the design, the more expensive it's going to be in terms of investment on your part, uh, you know, time and money and, and strength, right? If I design everything, you approve, that's relatively easy to handle. And if you want to involve your entire staff and assist me in the design and go through all that 80 iterations, then it's going to double, triple, or even quadruple the cost. Nice. So I usually, I used to sit in a client meeting and listening to their, all their feedbacks, and again, until I want to shoot myself. But here's the thing. When it comes to design, everybody seems to have a lot of opinions, which is why when I said if I go for a search engine opt optimization meetings, I'll just talk about the latest Google algorithm change, right? And if they can keep up with me, I really don't know why I would be, I'm, I'm there. But for design, whenever you put out a design, you always get ample amount of feedback. Everybody has opinions, right? So, um, but opinions can be dangerous. Uh, since we're talking about opinions, let me get your opinion on the following website. This is a car leasing website. It's called linscar.com. It's started by this Chinese lady called Lin. And it's a car leasing website. Can I have a show of hand? How many of you like the site? <laughs> right, so we have one person. How many, how many of you don't think it has a good user experience and you don't like the site? Okay, the rest of you don't have an opinion, or, or you just won't raise your hand. Okay, so uh, for those who do not think it has a good user experience, what would you change? Give me some response. <laughs> what do you say? Everything? Um, so it's, it's very 1999, right? And uh, for the slightly older crowd in the room, if you recall that Yahoo used to have this GeoCities section where everybody can create their own site. Well, if you're nodding, you just revealed to me your age. So they, they used to use these really bright color, pure colors, and, and fonts are all over the place, which is kind of this, uh, if we want to use a nicer word, is a retro design, okay? Now, how about this website? It's a, it's a dating website. Don't ask me how I know it, and don't ask me whether I've used it. But it's a dating website. It's called plentyoffish.com. Yes, very apt. So, what do you think of the design? How many people like it? How many people would actually use it? Again, don't ask me whether I have used it or not. 
How many people would actually use it? Nobody? Okay. Um, what would you change? Would you like, would you, pro how many people do you think that they actually need a redesign? Okay, very good. Now, the third website I want to get your opinion on is this one. How many people would redesign this website? I see some of you are hesitating because why? Because a lot of you already know about this website. You know that Craigslist is a wildly successful website, and therefore you wouldn't change a thing. But if you had never heard of this website, then you probably would tell me, yes, I would like to change its website. It still looks very 1996, which it does, <coughs> right? So Craigslist is, is a pretty interesting website. It was started by, you guessed it, Craig. And Craig started this website in 1996. Uh, and over the past 20 years, the site remains relatively unchanged. And mind you, 20 years in internet years is like a century. Even Coca-Cola has gone through multiple re, uh, revisions of their uh, can design, right? And if you think about it, in 20 years, they haven't really changed the style of their marketing. What does that tell you? Well, perhaps don't fix something if it ain't broken. Right? But so redesign can actually be very costly, very risky. Um, you might have also heard of this website, dig.com. In 2008, it was one of the most popular websites on the internet. It received a huge amount of traffic. In 2008, it was actually worth $160 million. And two years later, in 2010, they decided it was a time for a revamp. So what did they do? They redesigned the website. Within the first month of redesign, the traffic dropped 26%. And then it went downhill from there. In 2012, which is two months later, it was sold for, guess how much? It was sold for half a million. So it went from $160 million to half a million. Now, I'm not saying that redesign was the sole culprit of this. There were other factors, like the rise of Facebook. But I'm sure redesign played an important part. Right? So redesign can be very risky. Now, you, as the smart audience in the group, already know where I'm going with this. When it comes to opinions, there is more to it than meets the eye. This is linscar.com. Business Week calls it one of the best websites on the internet. You know why? Because the whole retro... So I actually watched this uh, BBC interview of this, this, this lady. Um, her, her rationale for creating such a website is that every website was looking the same. You know, now this was a slider, carousel, then several sections, right? So she really wanted to attract the attention of the public. It was more of a public, public stunt, and it worked. Every website was reporting this. Most people... The audience that they attracted actually already expected to see something like this, right? So it was actually part of the traffic strategy. And if you actually get past the initial reaction of what the hell is going on here, you actually discover it has all the persuasive device necessary to convert audience. For example, here it says, I'm Lin, I'm from Dragon's Den. Dragon's Den, how many people know Shark Tank? It's this American uh, reality show where entrepreneurs go onto TV and uh, you know, try to get investment from VCs. Dragon's Den is UK's equivalent of that. Somebody was actually trying to uh, buy, buy her out and she said no. Right, so that's social proof and he says, in 2010 I rented 35 million of cars, so on and so forth. And he has this assurance device that says, what happened when I press order now? You know, don't worry, you won't be charged, you do not commit. It has all the right call to action, it even has um, life support. And all these different elements are scattered around the page. I'm saying, if you do not leave, if you actually go through the page, a lot of them will convert. The website receives millions of visitors every year and is one of the most successful car leasing websites on the internet. How about the next one? The site I may or may not have used. Plenty of fish. Two years ago, in 2015, the site got acquired for $575 million. Again, this is a very interesting story. So the creator um, was somebody called Marcus Freind, and he was a developer. In 2003, there was this new programming language called ASP.NET. I think it was from Microsoft. Right? Some of you would have heard of it. So Marcus Freind, as a developer, he thought, it would be really good if he could add one line that says proficient in ASP.NET on his resume. But he didn't really want to read books and stuff. So he thought, why not create a website as practice? Right? So he just slapped on a basic website. And to his surprise, people were just signing up. I mean, 
And then before he knew it, um, two years later, he was making $10,000 every day from Google AdSense. If you haven't heard of Google AdSense, it's that little revenue program where you make about $2 for every thousand impressions. He was making $10,000 every day. Now, it, was, it got acquired for $575 million, and uh, the interesting thing is that because he, was, uh, he wasn't really in the whole startup game. By the time he figured out what VC meant, venture capitalist, he, was, he had more cash than he would ever be able to spend. So he owned 100% of the company till the day he got acquired. And if you go to plentyoffish.com, I think right now it's pof.com, you will still see a very retro design, a very basic design. Right, so what I'm trying to say here, I'm trying to say that opinions can be very dangerous. If I go to a client meeting, and our discussion becomes your opinions versus mine, it's not very productive because I can't really tell which one is correct. Either one could be correct, right? We can joke about clients all day long because I enjoy doing that. But the ironic and sometimes scary thing is your client may very well be correct and you may, may very well be wrong. I just don't know which one. Again, you know where I'm going with this since the title of my, my, my presentation is analytics, right? So instead of letting opinions drive um, your design decisions, you really should be using what? Data? But here's the thing. Most designs are driven by opinions, although we don't call it opinions. We call it experience. That's just another word for opinions. What's the second thing that people usually base their design decisions on? It's so-called best practices. Which is why nowadays you see all these similar bootstrapping websites. Some of you would know the, or use the uh, CSS framework, Bootstrap, right? They pretty much look all the same. In fact, if you Google every freaking bootstrap, bootstrap site ever, you will see the standard bootstrap layout. And also nowadays you see a lot of uh, websites with the first screen above the fold. It's all the slider. We call it carousel. Uh, with a left arrow, right arrow, then some dots at the bottom, which nobody clicks. Right? So you're doing that only because everybody else is doing that. That's industry best practices. The third one is com competition, competitors. Again, often when I go for client meetings, I would hear things like, you know, our competitors are A, B, C. A is doing this, I really like it. B is doing this, great. C, can we combine all of them? I don't know if we can combine all of them. This would work if your competitors actually know what they're doing, which is not always the case, right? If you blindly follow them, you're gonna, it's a classic case of the blind leading the blind. And the fourth one is a little bit tricky. It's called HIPPO. And HIPPO stands for highest paid person's opinion, which happens more often than you think, especially if you're dealing with the boss on the other side. Right? Although we tend to think, yes, we will speak our mind. But in the, actual, in, the, in the actual boardroom, whenever the boss opens his mouth, the boss says, I like blue. Like, I don't like yellow. The, the website will probably become blue. Right? The highest person's paid a person's opinion is also very dangerous. Right? Um, these are all opinions, but you should really be using data to guide your design decisions. Why? Because as they say, numbers don't lie. The problem with numbers is that numbers can also be very ambiguous. Right? If I tell you right now that I don't have any girlfriend, in other words, my girlfriend count is zero, that data point, you may draw the conclusion that I am a very boring and unattractive guy, which you might be very correct, but I think you should look at other factors. For example, I haven't told you whether I'm married or not. In fact, I am married and I have a loving wife, then all of a sudden that data point isn't so negative at all, right? It means that I am loyal and faithful like all the husbands in the room, I hope. So when it comes to data, we'd like to talk about the framework of data inside and actions. Data themselves are not worth much. Data do not have intrinsic value. We can't really do anything about data. The insights derived from the data is what we want. But then again, if you derive a piece of insight, you can't do anything about it. Let's say if I tell you that 56% of your users use Singtel or use a particular startup uh, as ISP, right? You can't really do anything about it. That's a piece of insight which is not actionable. So in the context of analytics, that's not very useful. What we want are actionable insights derived from data. And that's what analytics means to me. 
So I think there are four main areas that analytics can help you with. The first area, very simple, is decision making. Right? If you say which version is better, A version or B version. Now here's an example. Here's a website uh, with the photo of a cute baby. Now, if I do not show you the heat map, then I, I will conduct a poll. I say, how many of you like version A and version B? Probably 50-50. And then it's opinion, your opinion versus somebody else's opinion. But if I show you this heat map, by the way, if you do not know what heat map means, it actually means uh, a visual representation of how much attention your users are paying to every, a particular element of the page. So if I'm constantly looking at, say, top right, top left corner, and everybody else does so, then that particular area will be represented by a hot color, such as red or yellow. And if I'm not totally paying any attention to, say, the bottom right, then that uh, screen, part of the screen is usually marked as a cold color, uh, such as blue or white. Right? So this is a heat map. And it tracks the movement of the pupil. That's the most uh, advanced form of heat map tracking. Uh, the next best thing is to track mouse click. Right? But anyway, so this is a heat map. That's data inside action. So what is the data here? Can somebody tell me what you can what do you see in this uh, visual representation? What are the part of the screen that visitors pay most attention to? The face. Actually, the eyes. Now, as humans, thousands of years of evolution or you know, basic social etiquette dictates that we should look at the other person when he's talking to us, so we usually instinctively look at the other person in the eye, which is also true when it comes to web design. If I see somebody looking out of the screen at me, I instinctively look at his eyes. But we also have another instinct, which is, if I look at that, then a lot of you will also look at that. So instead of having the baby look at you, where you will stare at the, right at the baby and not the text, you should let the baby look at the actual part of the screen where you want people to pay attention to, which is the headline and the first paragraph. Right? So that is data. Data tells us people pay attention to eyes. What's the insight? The insight is line of sight should guide people to whichever part that is most important on the screen. Action, well, choose B. And also, in our future designs, we should also pay attention to line of sight. Right? Well, Obama does that. Hillary Clinton does that. So there's no reason not to do it. <laughs> right? So that is data inside action. So for the following slide, I, I always want to ask you to um, discuss everything in this framework. Let's, let's look at another example. So here's a website. How many people like it? This is no longer a trick question. <laughs> they actually did redesign this website and got better response. OK? So if I look at this website, my first impression is that it's a little bit busy. People, things are all over the place. A lot of arrows, a lot of pictures, a lot of words. So what we can try is, say, a text-based website where you explain to me in detail what the benefits of this particular software is. Or you could just uh, use imagery. You can slap on some really attractive image and ask me to sign up. But I really don't know which might work. So well, you let data to tell us, right? So they came up with two versions, one text-based and one image-based. In this case, which one won? The image-based. And I think, now you can always rationalize this and derive insights. What is the insight here? Data is text-based version lost to the image jury version. And the interesting thing is the image jury version really doesn't have a lot of arguments. It has a headline, but it's not explaining all the features and so on. It's, it's just very short. The, the text space actually goes on and on. All the information you need to make a decision. Well, normally, you would assume that the more information you give to the user, the more likely the user would convert. Not in this case. What is the insight here? One of the possible insights is that purchase is very different from trial. This is a software trial. In order for me to take up this no-risk trial, I really only want to know the major benefit, the major bullet points, and a happy person. I'll click trial, right? But if I'm selling the software, maybe it's a different story. I would hazard a guess that if I'm selling the software for $99 without any trial, people would, response better, would respond better to the first version. Does it make sense? But there's no way of telling. We always have to, have to uh, test. 
Now, the second purpose of analytics, in my mind, is to help you conduct user research. Now, I know a lot of you are UX designers, and you are obsessed with UX documents like persona, task analysis. All these different uh, user research are trying to help you achieve the task of finding more about the user. Well, you can conduct primary research, res uh, e survey, interviews, and all that, but it takes time. And also, in focus group or in interviews, people's response might be actually different from how they would behave in, in, in real life unsupervised. Right? So the more reliable data is actually what they do on the site. Again, this is a heat map. What's the data here? What's the hottest part of the screen? Right? These menu items. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right? How do we usually, as UX designers, decide the information architecture or the menu structure? Sometimes we uh, conduct this exercise called card sorting. How many know, uh, have, have used card sorting? So basically, you give uh, a deck of cards to users with all the different uh, pieces, and you ask them to reorganize, right? Based on how they perceive your information architecture, you would decide on the menu structure. But this tells us what people pay attention to the third and fourth section of the website, because they probably find it very important, right? So they should actually be the most prominent part of your navigation structure. And sometimes I also tend to see a lot of people pay attention to logo, which is not the case here. But a typical failing design is that all the, all the attention is given to a huge logo that occupies like two -thirds of the, uh, one third of the screen. And people are not actually paying to attention to what you want them to pay attention to. But let's say this part of the screen, it's a video. Let's say you spend a lot of money producing a video and you want people to actually watch the video. Then in this case, have you achieved that objective? Probably not, because people are not playing the video. So that's insight. What action should you do? Probably move the video around. So that's user research. Let me give you another example. Um, when you ask yourself, who are my users? What are you actually asking? What's their gender? What's their age? What are their interests? What kind of uh, devices do they use, like ISP? Some are really irrelevant. Some are really important. What do you think are the most important traits, important information when it comes to who are my users? What would you like to know if you can only know, say, five things? Oh, tough crowd. <laughs> Income. Income. Very good. Education. OK. Why income, why education? That actually depends on the, on the website. Why, why would you say income is, the most, uh, is pretty critical? Yes, but it doesn't actually mean the richer a person is, the more likely he's going to buy that particular piece of software or a particular, piece, a particular service. But I, I agree. It is one of the factors that we would like to find out, uh, which is kind of difficult to find out from analytics. What we are usually... What we can find out very easily is demographic data, age distribution, gender. By the way, this is a, a screenshot taken from Google Analytics. It is the most so popular analytics software out there because it's free. And I'm sure a lot of you, you have actually used it. Right? So uh, Google Analytics is divided into four sections, the audience section and the uh, Content, the, the conversion section, the behavior section, and acquisition section. They tell different stories. One is, who are your users? One is, where are they coming from? Which is kind of a behavior. One very important is what they do on your site, behavior. And technically speaking, conversion is also part of the behavior. But because it's so critical, they have separated it out as a fourth section. Right, so these four sections all tell their own stories. In the audience section, we will get data on age, gender, interest, geo, so geography. Why do we want to know these? They serve many, diff many purposes. One is every design decision you make, every content decision you make must align to their uh, demographic data and their interests. Right? Let's say most of you are, in this case, we see that the, the biggest group of visitors are 24 to 34 and male. So probably developers. <laughs> Right? So if these are the demographic, then maybe we can get away with making the website a little more technical than it is. But if we're looking at Pinterest, 
then we'll probably see a data like this, and it's, it's all women, right? So maybe you have to make uh, the language a little, bit, a little bit more uh, emotional, a flowery. If you are selling a car, you have to describe, ah, the, the seat is, the, the leather is taken from Italy, 10 people uh, are, are supervising it. If you, if you touch it, you will, feel, you will feel like in heaven or whatever. If you're explaining to a male audience, you say, zero to 100 kilometers per hour, 4.3 seconds. And it was like, oh, great car. And also, it ties to advertising, because I deal with advertising a lot, right? This section of the website, interest, lets us target people by interest, right? Normally, without analytics, you're just blind, blindly guessing. Here's another one. Which devices do my users use? Why do I want to find out about that? Some people are still not convinced that we should always go mobile first. Now, mobile first is the philosophy where you start the design with, uh, on a smaller screen and gradually expand on a larger screen. Uh, still, people aren't convinced because they think, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, two years ago, the number of mobile users had surpassed that of the desktop users, but just by how much? I'm not sure, but let's look at this. The words are a little bit smaller, but essentially, the top 10 group, almost all of them has a width of 360, 370, 400, 320. What does that tell us? It tells us the vast majority of users are browsing through a mobile device. Therefore, you have to rearrange the layout. You have to make the words slightly bigger. You have to make the call to action button slightly bigger so that they can navigate. Right? And you have to really uh, make sure that the information texture, architecture, the menu structure really elevates the most important part of the, uh, the section of the website, which, once again, depends on the analytics, right? as I shown you in the previous screenshot. Next question, how many people find my site useful? In other words, how many people think, yeah, we, I have a good user experience? What do you think is a typical trait or behavior of someone who enjoys my site? What does he or she do? Spend more time, so more time on site, come back. I think that's very important. Now, as a marketer, I deal with pro uh, marketing funnel every day. So marketing funnel essentially says that people do not convert on the first go. They go through a typical process of awareness, consideration, conversion, and loyalty. Right? When they first come to your website, very few people, a small percentage would actually convert. They will remember your site. They will probably compare you to your competitors. That's a consideration stage. And they, then they will come back and convert. So I want to know how many people are actually returning. Right, so this is returning users versus first-time users. So if I see this chunk to be really, really small, then I would be worried. That means the vast majority of my users, my visitors, are not coming back. Chances are they're not going to convert. Now, as the next step, as inside, I would actually add the so-called segments. So most analytics software lets you define your segment. Segment means a group of people with homo homogenous trait. So I would add, add a segment that only takes data from first-time users. I want to find out exactly how many first-time uh, users who do not return would actually convert, and how many of those returning users would convert, and after how many visits. Right? Google Analytics and all the other analytics software would tell you that. Now, the opposite side of that question is, how many users do not like my site? How many users actually think I have a terrible user experience? What do they do? They never return. And chances are they don't even proceed to the next page. Right? So they come to your page and leave. And we call that a bounce, right? as opposed to a sticky site where they stay. So if somebody comes to your web page and immediately leave, it's considered a bounce. So we want to find out what is the bounce rate. If you have a 50% bounce rate, that means, right? that means you're wasting half of your traffic because people do not proceed. Then I usually get the question uh, that uh, basically says, wow, our website is the latest trend. We only have one page. It's a single page website. Technically, all your visits are bounces. Right? They just land on the site and leave. What should we do? Now, there's something you can do. Instead of tracking page to page, you can track different elements, which we'll, I will talk about in, in the next few slides. So if you really want to find out how many people 
are not finding your site useful or you want to know that whether you have a terrible experience, look at the bounce rate. That's the first data I would look at, and as well as the time on page. Right? One more question. How do users behave on my site? Right? That's, again, a broad question. Now, as a UX designer, especially for the UI designers in the room, that, we, that you would usually uh, come up with all these mock-up and artboard, you will have screen flow, right? Screen A flows to screen B, B to C, C, you know, diverge, D1, D2, and so on. That's the ideal situation. You want people to go from, say, uh, using us as an example, we want people to know who we are as a marketing agency, so about us. Right? The next step is probably services or maybe case studies. So people want to know whether we're trustworthy, right? So social proof is big elements. About us, services, uh, uh, case studies. And then eventually we want all of them to go to the contact page and submit a query form or, or a, you know, quote, contact us. Right? That's the ideal flow. But are your visitors really following that flow? Right? So Google Analytics, again, similar to other analytics software, will show you that where people are going from one place to another. Perhaps they land on the home page first. And then most of them, depending on the thickness of the bar, they go to a particular page and that particular page Go to the next page. Now, if they are going all over the place, then you know that they are confused. They're not following the user, the screen flow that you had planned for them. And this will give you a rough overview of user's behavior. Of course, there are other sections of the analytics that we can make use of, um, but this is the most visual one. Now, that was inter-page behavior. How about on a particular page? So back to the previous question I asked. If I have a one-page website, or if I have e-commerce website where I want to know what people are, are doing before they order my product, uh, I want to know how many people are adding it to the cart, how many people are abandoning the cart, I can track different uh, elements on the screen. I can track how many people have clicked on the quick view, so that's e-commerce website where you examine the detail of the product, how many people are adding it to the cart, how many people are removing it to the cart. That's statistics. Tell me whether my prices are setting too high, whether my product description is detailed enough, so on and so forth. Now, the third area, so again, the first area is to help you make design decisions. Second is to help you conduct user research. The third one is to help you define UX success. Now, we like to talk about good UX experience, uh, user experience and bad user experience all the time. We say good UX, bad UX, but you can't really quantify them. If both sides have good user experience, which one is better? Right? There's got to be a way that you can measure. So all of us have KPI. UX should also have KPI. To us, the ultimate goal of good UX is not to make users say, wow, this is really creative. I like the color. Right? To us, the ultimate UX goal is to generate as many money-generating actions as possible. So I repeat. The number one goal for us as a marketing agency is to generate as many money generating actions as possible. That money generating actions could be an add to cart, could be uh, find out more, right? They all lead to the final conversion, which is a sale or a trial or a sign up. So you gotta quantify your user experience in that frame of work, right? You can't just say it's pretty or it's not pretty. So the next question is, how do we define our objectives? What are the possible goals that we can define as a UX designer? Now, if you're actually selling something, if you're an e-commerce platform, or if you're a software seller, then you would have sales or trials. Uh, if you're an agency, you would track people uh, who are calling, how many people are submitting queries, uh, even how many people are signing up for the newsletter, because newsletter's purpose is to lead nurture, right? To nurture the lead to the point that they are willing to convert. So all these different uh, goals can be tracked within Google Analytics. Now, this is the coding part. Uh, how it works is that you place a piece of JavaScript code in the source code of your website, and once you do that, Google Analytics this, uh, will track all of your page. Every time somebody clicks something on your page, that action will be sending a message to the Google Analytics server, and Google can track all of that. But then I, uh, another frequent question I get from uh, users is that, well, we don't sell anything. We don't even want people to call. 
our website only serves as an information portal. And we have lots of uh, pharmaceutical clients. Now, in Singapore, they are forbidden to sell anything online. So the only reason for their website is to provide information. What kind of goal can I set? What do you think? They, they don't have any sales, they don't have any phone calls, they don't have any inquiries. What do you think? What can you track as the goal? If you have two designs of such website, how would you decide one version is better than the other? Engagement, very good. So that means the time spent on site, the number of pages browsed, right? So you can set up that as well. Google Analytics and other web uh, analytics platform allow you to do that. You can define a goal to be greater than X pages or duration greater than X minutes, right? That is a simple way of quantify your UX. What I'm trying to say is that every single page should have a goal. It's either a conversion or a money generating action that leads, that contributes to another page's conversion. What if you know that 10 out of 100 people who are arriving on the site are filling out the form, meaning you have a 10% conversion rate, right? That could be bad or that could be good, depending on your historical data. But that doesn't tell me how I can improve. Because the form is a form, right? It's either removing that form or, or, or let it stay. What can I do to improve the conversion rate of the form on that page? Uh, this can be achieved by event tracking. An event uh, is Google's lingo. It basically means anything that people would interact with on the page. So if I click a button, if I download a PDF, if I click play on a video, that's an event. That's an action. Right? So if I am marketing through videos, I want to show the features of my product, and I want to know whether people are finishing watching the video, I can track the, uh, the progress of the play, right? whether it's 20%, 50%, or 75%, because that would tell me how engaged the user is or how I'm, I am doing explaining using video. Similarly, I can design, I can assign an event to each single field of this form. Why would I want to do that? because you will tell me the point where most people are dropping off. Now, we had this client, it's a banking client, and they had this big-ass form, right? And we're getting a really low conversion rate. So we, what we did is to uh, assign each form as an event. Then we, that way, we, we want to know whether people are dropping off in a linear fashion. If it is linear, then there's not a lot you can do. But if it's not linear, if it's dropping like this, and reaching a certain field in the form, all of them are, are stopped dead in their tracks, and you know that particular field in that form is causing the most problems, which turned out to be the case. Can you guess which form field is the culprit of stopping people from converting? Any guesses? Age? Date? Uh, no because I don't really care. Oh, you mean date of birth? Uh, no, the, the, the field in question is actually income. Because people are usually very private about their income, even to banks. Right? They don't like to review their income. So that's the data, that's the insight. What would be the action? How would you counter this... Uh, people's uh, uh, natural reaction, aversion to revealing their income. Several ways. One is not to ask them about income. The second is to explain in a way that your audience would understand, would feel that it's beneficial. You would explain that you are customizing the offer based on the income, for example. So anyway, you have to address that objection. Another example, uh, it's a local supermarket. And one of the field that stopping people dead in their tracks is actually date of birth. Because people don't want to review their date of birth. And it turns out that they are recording date of birth only because they want to send out birthday gifts. So if for that particular reason, you don't need the year number, right? You just need the month and, and the, 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 month of the, the day of the month. Right? So removing year actually boosts the conversion rate. So that's a uh, micro-conversion. Again, it's... Uh, it's that coding part of this presentation 
where you can assign different fields. So uh, some of you are, should be quite technical, right? In JavaScript, uh, you would be able to know whether a, f a field is, is blur, is focused or not. Whenever that field is focused, you can send a message through JavaScript to Google Analytics server to tell Google that this particular field is clicked and entered information. If uh, that field is untouched, then you know that people are not going beyond that form, right? So um, the final screenshot in this section I want to show you is uh, what I touched upon just now. It's number of pages per session. It goes back to the statement I made earlier that data can be ambiguous. So if I am telling you that I have two websites or before redesign, after redesign, after redesign, we are getting higher pages browse per session. Your natural conclusion is that it's a good thing, right? People are seeking more information. But that's not always the case. In w under which circumstances do you think that a higher number of pages browse per session is actually a negative thing? Searching for something? Yeah, very good. So it could mean that people want more information. It also could mean that people are not finding the information they're looking for. This is especially true for a support site. So you can designate the support part of your website uh, to be tracked by analytics, only the support pages. If you see an increase in number of pages browse, then you know that your support pages are not doing an as good job. So that's the data insight. What's the action? How can you make sure that you're tracking this correctly? Have you been to one of the software websites, the documentation, where at the end they say, do you find this article helpful? Or is your problem solved? Now I can bet that on each of those buttons they have set up event tracking. Every time somebody clicks, uh, I find this article helpful, or uh, my problem is solved, the analytics, the back end, the analytics would know that those questions are marked as solved. So instead of looking at the average number of pages browsed, they will look at that as a conversion. Okay, so the final reason for analytics, and I think is the most important aspect of analytics, is to constantly improve your response rate. Now, we are a marketing agency, we're obsessed with performance. And here's something that outsiders typically don't know. Um, let me give you an analogy. I used to do a lot of copywriting. And as copy, copywriters would know this, that they will try to write the most effective headline from the start, but chances are they will fail, because there's really no reason, no way to know that, uh, to guarantee that you will have the best headline from the start. But there are copywriting formulas. For example, uh, a typical headline that will work, it's the how-to headline, like how to uh, make $10,000 in five weeks, how to attract beautiful girls quickly and easily, even if you're ugly and short. I mean, I would respond to that headline, obviously, but what if, if other people's response are different from mine? There's no way of telling. Right? So the only way of constantly improving your response rate is to split test and putting on different versions of the headline or different elements of the website and let the data speak. Good marketing agencies or good copywriters, good UX designers, probably won't give you the best version from the start, but what separates from the uh, uh, average agency and the stellar agency is their ability to constantly improve, right? Which you should always use analytics to guide your split testing. Always have multiple versions. Let me go back to this, this uh, example. So we now know that an image-based version outperforms the text-based version. What's the natural next step? What else would you like to try? Sorry, video? Very nice. So text, uh, image, video, that's something we could try. What else? What else would you like to try? Everybody's drowsy because of the food. So if I know that putting on a face to the website, to the software, helps us convert, then maybe the na next thing we could try is to try different faces, <laughs> right? Now, as you can see that Michael has the biggest lift in conversion rate and John has 
There's really no way of telling. Now, I think it's a t-shirt, but that might not be the actual reason. The only way to tell is through analytics, right? Let the data speak. Now, the next thing they could try is perhaps the headline or based on one piece that we talked about earlier is to have all of them turning right or turning left to look at the headline. That's something we could try, right? Uh, we could also try the call to action. Now, typically, the elements that lead to the biggest lift in conversion are headline, image, call to action, beginning paragraph, these four things. So um, let me tell you just very quickly what other tools that we use uh, for UX improvement. One is called Quantcast or similar web. Now, Google Analytics is very good, or all the analysts software are very good at uh, extracting insight from your own data. But what about your competitors? Right, so similar web and Quantcast, all these third-party websites, they track almost all the major websites out there on the internet. So you can almost um, get insights the same way that you can get insight from your own website. Right? Google Analytics is obviously a good one, but the problem with Google Analytics is that it's anonymous. All the data are anonymized because Google doesn't want people to know who the actual visitor are. You can only get statistical data, meaning 10 out of how many people are doing this, but you don't know what a particular person is doing. So Kissmetrics is, and several other solutions will tell you what exactly a single person is doing. John has come to the website 10 times. Each time he's, he spent two, two minutes. On the third time, he converted to sign up for a newsletter. On the eighth time, he submitted a contact form. So Kissmetrics and several other solutions will give you that level of detail. Uh, another one is Crazy Egg. Crazy Egg gives you heat map. It generates heat map uh, based on where people are clicking on the page. But that's the next best thing. The, real good, the really good uh, heat map is generated by tracking the eye movement, the pupil movement. I think the cheapest device is like $100. Uh, next one is called InspectLED. Again, this is, there are a whole, whole load of uh, software that works like this. How it works is it records user screen. Many of you probably have used similar solutions. So basically, it lets you observe the user's interaction with your website as if you're looking over his shoulder. So that's very good at uh, deducing primary data. And if you're selling an app or if your um, business is app-based, then you obviously want to use Mixpanel, which has a big focus on mobile analytics, and App Any, as the name suggests, it gives you the, the data on the uh, app landscape, what other people are doing versus you are. And if you want to improve your split testing, uh, here are the two industry standards, basically Optimizely and Visual Website Optimizer. It lets you uh, concurrently test multiple, ver multiple elements of the page. So you can conduct not just A-B testing, but also A-B-C-D-E-F-G uh, uh, testing. We call it multivariate testing. Right? So these are the uh, types of software that we use on a daily basis. So with that, uh, let me do a quick recap. So what have I talked about today? The first thing is that opinions can be risky. Right? Opinions, your opinions versus mine, is not a very productive discussion. So we don't know whose opinion we should rely on. The only way we can uh, get actionable insight, reliable insight, is through data. But data themselves are ambiguous. You have to think in terms of data, insight, and action. Always let action guide your, uh, action should be the design decisions and always let it guided by the insights you derive from numbers. And uh, finally, we talked about the four areas where analytics can help you. It will end all the debates. It will help you conduct user research. It helps you measure your UX success and it helps you improve your website, your user experience uh, over time. Right, so with that, uh, I want to end my presentation. If you have any questions right now, I would like to take them. You can clap. <laughs> questions? Yes, please. Hello. Yes. yes. Um, recently, um I had a client who actually had their um, um, uh, porter in the travel advisor. This is his, they are the travel agents. Um, basically, uh, 
they did a social like SMO sort of like digital marketing. So we helped them and we targeted them and everything was, you know, on track what they KPIs and everything. But they complain and they say that, oh, there's no conversion, nobody's calling and everything like that. And so they blame us for basically that's happening because you're not doing a good job and you're supposed to do that. So how, how do we actually yep. try to explain to them? That is a great, great question. Um, so the question is, if you're doing social media marketing and often that you observe there is no conversion from Facebook. Let's say you, you post constantly on Facebook but nobody is actually converting from the links there. Right? That's a typical problem. It goes back to the, uh, the product funnel, the marketing funnel that I mentioned. People usually go from awareness to consideration to conversion to loyalty. So we call it the top of the funnel and the bottom of the funnel. Social media is typically a top of the funnel element. Meaning to say, social media is very good at generating awareness, but visitors has to go through multiple steps before they are converting. Now the analytics tracks in such a way that if I come from Facebook the first time and land on your site, and I remember your brand, ABC, right? The next time I search on Google ABC, I either click on your ad or I click on your listing, that's no longer a social media visit. That conversion will be counted towards either SEO, search engine, organic traffic, or that will be counted towards ad. Which is why across all businesses that Facebook or social media have very low conversion rate. The only way to explain to them, or a very effective way, is to use something called a multi-channel funnel, which you can't really see on this page. But some here, down here, some, uh, a part of uh, Google Analytics down here, there is a section called conversion. You click on conversion, there is a, a section called MCF, multi-channel funnel. What multi-channel funnel is, does is to analyze the entire user journey, the entire path. So because Google has access to everybody's cookie, right? So if the first time I came from uh, Facebook, the second time I came from ad, the third time I came from organic search, the fourth time is a direct typing URL into the search engine, and then I convert. Google will not only tell you that, yes, the last direct visit resulted in a conversion, but it will also show you the entire path. So, uh, Facebook, ad, uh, organic, direct. Then Google also does this statistical analysis on what the typical path is. It will tell you out of all the sessions resulting in a conversion, out of all of these, how many of them, in how many of them does Facebook or social media play a role? So you can actually tell your clients, look, um, out of all these 100 conversions, you're right, only 10 of them was the last step where Facebook played a role. But actually, in 60 to 70 out of them, there was this element of social media. Facebook was present throughout this entire journey, throughout this entire conversion path. So that's what we usually use. Any other questions? If not, you can always email me at... Uh, yeah. There's another question over there. Right. You can always email me, by the way, or add me on LinkedIn. Um, um, uh, let's say if a client, uh, they are having a sale campaign, uh, and then uh, they come to us, and then they, uh, they want to us to improve the um, conversion rate, right? And then, so how we do the testing so without, without affecting the sale campaign? without affecting the sales. Now that is, so if I understand correctly, you're saying let's test multiple versions of the website while sustaining the sales. Yes. That is kind of tricky. It's, it's more like a chicken and egg question because if you do not test, then you wouldn't know whether there's opportunity for you to improve. But if you test, then chances are it can go up or it can go down. So your sales would be affected. That's how testing works. So you have to uh, let the client know, and the client can actually decide together with you how much of your traffic you want to test. So what typically happens to the, these uh, uh, multi-regional brands, right, uh, MNCs? They do not test with 100% of the traffic. That would be very risky. What they do is to test only 10% of the traffic. Or 
these big brands, they will start with a particular country. But let's say if yours is a smaller brand, you can say, let's not uh, go crazy and test the 100% of the traffic. Let's test with 20% of traffic. Uh, 10, so 80, uh, sorry, 90 and 10. Now actually, you set aside the 80%, and you only test the remaining 20%, it's 10% versus 10%, then you can already see some, some improvements. But uh, here's another thing I want to bring up. Um, the benefits, the major benefits of working with an agency with analytics experience is not just the approach they adopt, but also the insights they have gathered throughout the years. Let's say that line of sight thing, right? Most, most people would not know it because they have never made such tests. But if you are working with an agency with uh, such experience, then based on all the past tests that they had conducted in the past, they would choose the version that is likely to result in an uplift instead of a, down, a downgrade in performance. So to summarize, don't test 100% of the traffic. Go with uh, an agency who is versed in testing. OK, if no more questions, like I said, always, you can always email me or add me on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. <laughs>